Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for having us here, here today, Congressman. We really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, the hard work that your staff has also put in today. Uh, my name is Lamar Bailey. I am a Policy Impact Coordinator from the American Friends Service Committee. Um, the American Friends Service Committee program touches a wide range of issues, countries, and communities. What unites them is the unfaltering belief in the essential worth of every human being, nonviolence as a way to resolve conflict, and the power of love to overcome oppression, discrimination, and violence. AFSC believes that all people in prison are entitled to proper medical care, appropriate mental health services, and interaction with others. AFSC opposes procedures that are dehumanizing and violate the humanity within those who are incarcerated. We carry out our policy work and education around, conditions, around the conditions of confinement, mass incarceration, and conflict resolution through a healing justice program across the country. For example, we raised awareness of abuse in California, including serving as, as the prisoner selected mediator in the Pelican Bay hunger strike in California this year, where 12,000 prisoners across the state joined the protest of abuse and of other issues. Through AFSC's Prison Watch, we have documented testimonies of individuals who have been victims of chemical, physical, sexual, and no-touch torture. And I'd like to share some of those stories with you in the words of the victims. How do you describe desperation to someone who is not desperate? Begin a le letter to the AFSC from Audrey Latulo, a prisoner at the Trenton State Prison in New Jersey. He described conditions in which all prisoners in the management control, control unit were awakened every other morning at 1 a.m. by guards dressed in riot gear, holding barking, salivating dogs. Once awakened, the prisoners were forced to strip, gather their belongings while feeling the dogs straining at their leashes, snapping toward their private parts as they are trained to do. He described being terrorized, intimidated, and humiliated in the humiliation of being naked and not knowing whether the mass guards were male or female. This went on for an entire summer until activists inside and out were able to stop the senseless torture. If you think back to slavery and to the images of the civil rights movement, we can begin to understand that dogs have been used as a device of torture for hundreds of years in the United States. The proportion of complaints coming from women has risen also. Women describing conditions of confinement which can be classified as torture. They suffer from sexual abuse by staff. One woman saying, I'm tired of being gynecologically examined every time I'm searched. Another put it, that was not part of my sentence to perform oral sex with officers. Women have reported the inappropriate use of restraints on pregnant and sick prisoners, including one, one woman whose baby was coming at the time the guards who had shackled her legs was on break somewhere else in a hospital. We have received reports about, about women who died of pancreatic disease that went undiagnosed, about a mentally ill woman who was confined, confined naked in a filthy cell where she ingested her own bodily waste, about a woman who suffered burns over 54% of her body and gradually lost mobility when she was denied the special bandages that would have kept her, kept her skin from tightening, and from a woman who begged staff to allow her to see a doctor for months to no avail. Before, before finally being diagnosed with cancer and enormous pain with no medication, she died nine months after the diagnosis. Mentally ill Frank Hunter in New Jersey was forced into an isolation unit. The guards taunted and teased this man, made him dance as he begged them for cigarettes, water, or food while they laughed. Frank Hunter killed himself. A mentally ill prisoner who had wiped his body with feces was put into a bath so hot it boiled 30% of the skin off his body. In this world of AIDS and other bloodborne pathogens, prisoners reported being thrown into a cell which had a wet, bloody doorknob, bloody walls, and bloody floors from the previous occupant who had attempted suicide. He spent six hours standing, afraid to touch anything. The testimonies we have received from people in prisons have widened our understanding that devices of torture are virtually limitless. Sex, sadism, sleep, water deprivation, use of dogs, or withdrawal, withdrawal of any of those things necessary for human, mental, and physical health can be used as tools of torture. The hole, the bucket, the can. The box, the hole, the bing. The chiller. Lock up. Maxi, maxi. The shoe. Solitary confinement. The cell was probably like maybe seven feet, maybe nine feet long. Maybe nine by six. It's, it's very small. The cell was a windowless cell. Uh, the walls were cinder block. The floor 
it was concrete. The bed is concrete. There's a uh, small concrete slab that serves as your table. You had nothing in the room but you. It's hard to describe nothing. This your lonely body in a cell that's empty. That's what solitary confinement is. Metal and cement. That was it. <laughs> The light. There's lights on um, most of the night. Double neon light. The light would be on sometime 24-7. It never went out. The situation I was in, they never turned the lights on. The lights were out 24 hours a day. There was a big door that closed and you didn't hear anything outside of the door. It can get eerily quiet in these places. Real quiet. Most of what you're going to hear is your own breathing. You might hear your heart rate pumping up. And so when there is a noise, it's just nerve-wracking. Coming onto the tier, it's a heavy steel door, and it opens electrically, which means you hear... I really wanted to talk to somebody, you know, just somebody to be there. You can go days without talking to people, sometimes weeks, sometimes months. You can't touch anyone. No, no human touch, except for aggressive touching by guards when they would come in to chain me up to take me out. Even if you have family, there's no contact visits at all. There's a glass in front of you with the person visiting you on the other side. My daughters were trying to kiss the glass and kiss me through the glass. It was painful. It was very painful. I've spent seven and a half years in the control unit. Maybe about 12 years in lockdown. I was there for 29 years, you know. Many, many years in solitary confinement. 29 years. Solitary confinement is just as real as real could be. It could, um, it could wipe the mind. It damaged you psychologically, you know, because uh, human beings need to interact with each other. It's not normal to be in the dark for days and days and days on end. I could hardly sleep. Like I, was, I had insomnia. Waking up at night in the sweats, panic attacks. It would trigger something in my nerves when I would break out in hives from head to toe. I lost track of time. There's no concept of time. You know no time in lockdown. There's sleep and awakeness. That's it. And the madness in between. The madness in between. I would try to hear things, try to hear human voices. And um, sometimes I would imagine that I was hearing noises. You start hearing things that's not even being said. And you'd say, yeah, you know, yeah, what? You know he's answering. The anger, the rage, bitterness, the anxiety, the nightmares. And, and as years passed, it just seemed like the walls in the cell begin to close in. They begin to close in. You can feel your mind like trying to escape from you. And what happens is chaos. Insanity. Insanity. They'll say the end of the barrel. That's what the prison officials call it. Call it maximum security, administrative segregation. Control unit. Stigma unit. Isolation. Special housing. La solapa. Seg you know, on and on and on and on and on. So many of them. I will say torture chambers. No other way to describe them. Of course it's torture. It, it, it's, it's torture in every form of fashion.
Yes, hello everyone. My name is John Matt Gaskins. I'm a local community organizer here in DC, mostly involved with prison support work, some other more direct activities in local communities. Um, I was released from prison in July after spending 14 years um, in prison throughout two states, Maryland and Virginia. A lot of the things that we're talking about here today, I've witnessed them and endured them. Um, the last six years I was in prison, I was in two of the worst prisons in this country. There in Virginia, Walnut Ridge and Raritan State Prison. Um, the notoriety of the latter can be seen here. It made the Washington Post the front page um, just on January 7th, you know, this month, just a few days ago, um, for its use of solitary confinement. Um, these prisons, you know, from, from the moment that you enter these prisons, um, Red Onion and Long Ridge, I mean, the intimidation begins there. I remember when the bus pulled up, the first thing that we saw were like 15 guards. They have on jump boots, riot gear, they have on helmets, they have shields, they have maybe four or five dogs. And, you know, they're pulling guys off the bus, you don't get a chance to walk off, they're snatching guys off. These are both Superman prisons. They're snatching guys off the bus and they're, they're saying stuff like, there's no other prisons like this in the country. Um, you know, you're gonna do what you're told, or you'll be beaten, you'll be killed. Um, and you can go on the internet, I mean, these prisons, they've done it. Um, it's, it's, it's all over the internet of folks that have been killed at these prisons. Um, my first day there at, at Red Island, I was beaten unconscious. <coughs> They say that the two reasons that you go there is because you're like um, an extremely violent prisoner or that you have an extremely long sentence. You know, both of those reasons are, are untrue. The reason that you go to these prisons is because you've been identified as someone who uh, files grievances, someone that speaks up on the behalf of other prisoners. You've been identified as a, you know, an organizer in some sense. You, recognize, rec uh, you represent a voice of dissent. At least that's the reason I was there. So when I got off the bus, there was this young lady, she had a clipboard. And it was unbeknownst to me and everyone else on the bus, but on this clipboard, she had a list of guys that they felt needed to be tamed. And I was one of those guys. So when I come in, you know, they, they try to provoke me with this very, you know, dehumanizing process where they make you strip naked and you have to bend over, spread your buttocks. Um, you know, they're gonna continue to do this until they're satisfied with your level of humiliation. So, you know, instead of beginning the process, I refused. And they beat me unconscious, they stripped me naked, they drug me across the compound naked. I don't remember any of this, I just remember where I woke up. I had scars on my feet, my face, you know, looked like the elephant man. Um, and it was just the beginning. <laughs> At this prison, it's a supermax prison, so you're already going 23 hours a day, locked down. They have, at this prison, two super safe units, where it's even worse. They have windowless cells, which is, is, is torture. I mean, this is sensory deprivation. You don't know what it feels like to, you know, not be able to look outside and see a tree. You don't know how much you appreciate that until you don't have that opportunity to see another person. What this guy was just talking about on the tape, the only interaction you have with someone else is a guard who's spitting in your tray, um, putting feces in your tray. Um, but anyway, they put me in this super safe unit. Here, they're not feeding guys. You only get showers three days a week, and that is at the discretion of the guard. If he doesn't feel like pulling showers, you don't get a shower today. Um, because to come out of the cell any time they have to um, chain you up, put on shackles, uh, um, handcuff you behind your back, put this dog leash on you, and walk you to the shower, which is like this very small area, enclosed area, you only get about a six minute shower. And the uh, outside rent cage is a dog kennel. Um, maybe from that wall to the edge of that file cabinet, and from that wall to this blue trash can. That's the rec area. Um, so a lot of guys don't even go outside because it's such a humiliating process. You have to strip naked, 
Um, maybe get slapped upside the head by the guards. I mean, they're abusing guys every day here for no reason, just because they don't want to pull recreation and you decide you want to go outside, so they're going to abuse you. Um, no, but it got worse. In this unit, I would witness them, maybe a guy come out for a shower, they would step on his shackles and trip him up. Um, the good thing is we did have guys there that were, you know, organized, because we understood that our very survival depended on us putting together some course of action and actually keeping that. No, I mean, they were killing guys here. There's guys that's been found in their cell, they've been hanged. You know, the official report is that they committed suicide, they didn't commit suicide, the guards entered their cell and killed them. Um, so when we were protesting, beating another prisoner, they would, uh, you know, just come up with false pretense to enter all of our cells. A cell extraction is necessary. And this is when six or seven guards come, they have shields, they have dogs, they have all the um, pepper spray, and what's become known as the finger bending te technique. <laughs> um, you know, once they get you fully restrained, you're handcuffed, you're shackled, you're totally defenseless, six, six men laying on top of you. They bend your fingers back until they break them, or at least, at least a great effort is put into that. I've had my fingers broken various times, I mean, it got to the point where I was used to it, totally not sensitive to it. Um, my first time hearing a, a cell extraction or witnessing one, I heard guys screaming. And it was like, why is this guy screaming? He was screaming because they were breaking his fingers. They also will rip your shoes off, they'll try to break your toes, they'll squeeze your testicles, I mean anything. These guys um, pepper spray on their fingers, they put them in your eyes. Uh, and this was just the beginning, again. Um, they have this, this, uh, this thing called five-point restraints where they strap you to a bed, you know, you're strapped down on both wrists, both ankles, and then there's this big belt across your chest, you strap you there, sometimes you're left there for two days straight, you don't eat when you're there, um, they're supposed to let you up, um, like every four or five hours since the bathroom, that's not going to happen. So you're forced to defecate on yourself, urinate on yourself. I went through this maybe 10 times. And while you're down there, the officers may come through and uh, ask you something like, well, are you going to be a good boy? You know, if you say, well, no, I'm not going to be a good boy. I did nothing wrong. Um, then they have a shield. Every time you're in your cell, it's supposed to be on, um, you know, on camera, but, you know, the camera is broken, and they turn the camera off, they cover the microphone, whatever. And they have a shield, allegedly to protect themselves from you, even though you're strapped to a bed, you can't get up. And what they'll do is they'll spray pepper spray on the shield, and they'll hold it down on top of you like they're talking to you, and the pepper spray drips into your eyes. Um, and again, that's just the beginning. I mean, it just kept getting worse and worse. At these prisons, when there's any sort of incidents, they bring in the dogs also. They have one unit that's called progressive housing unit, where it's nothing less than segregation. Two, two, two men in one cell. They call it population, but you're locked down the same amount of time as guys in segregation. So it's basically um, uh, two-man segregation. You're locked in the cell 23 and a half hours a day, 23 hours a day. And all sorts of things happen in the cells, men are raped. Um, and a lot of that is intentional. The guards put guys in cells with guys that are known to be sexual predators, put them in a the cell, hope they get raped. You do this to young guys and to guys who, again, represent a voice of dissent. Um, so, yes, in this, in this unit that's a, a progressive housing um, unit, we are, you know, allowed like 30 minutes out of our cells every three or four days come out in this little small area. And if there's a fight, I mean, clearly there's going to be a lot of tension. You've got these men caged up like they're animals. Even animals shouldn't be caged up, but you have these men caged up like they're in a zoo. There's a lot of frustration. These prisons are strategically placed so that they separate. Um, they're separated from the communities where these folks come from. They're on the other side of the state. They actually blew out a mountaintop to build Wildwood State Prison. They blew the prison, the mountain, the top off the mountain, 
built the prison down in the mountain. They had to blow out the road, you know, mountain to build the road. It wasn't even accessible by road. And it's about an eight hour trip in the same state from Richmond, where most of these guys come from, to the prison. So these guys don't get visits. I didn't have a visit, I was there. I didn't get a visit the whole time I was there simply because my family couldn't afford to come and see me. So there's a lot of tension there. These guys are constantly, you know, enjoying the humiliation, the assaults, you know, so they're frustrated. And like most oppressed people know, I mean, they take it out on each other rather than go up against their oppressor. They've been conditioned to believe that, you know, there's no chance of success. Um, so maybe these guys get into a fight. What they do is they have a guard in the tower, and he's shooting these rubber bullets from a 12-gauge shotgun. Even though it's a rubber bullet, this is a real gun, it's a 12-gauge shotgun, and he's firing this gun. This is how they break up a fight. They don't come in and, and break the guys up. They fire this gun. I saw two men get their eyes shot out. Another guy got shot in the back, paralyzed him. And when that doesn't work, they bring the dogs in and just turn them loose in the, in the unit. One man got bit in the head that wasn't involved with the fight. No, I mean, it's just horrible conditions at these prisons. Um, I came here today, you know, to, to share my story and maybe help raise awareness um, as to the need to pass some sort of legislation. Um, you know, I, I asked the congressman that question a few moments ago. I feel like, you know, the bill could, could be revised a little. I feel like it's a huge compromise and the police's badge becomes a shield. Um, because no matter what he does, if he doesn't kill someone, he knows that you know he can only get 10 years in prison. And beyond that, how about we look up some numbers as to how many police officers are even taking the trial you know, for assaulting people or killing people. It usually doesn't get past the grand jury. Um, justified the homicide, and if he does, it's the Oscar Grant, like an opening, he shot this young boy, shot him in the back, Police officer gets two years in prison. No, that's not justice for this guy. It's not justice for his family. It's not justice for a community. So I, I did come here. I feel like the bill is it, a step in the right direction, and I'm in full support of it. But um, there's definitely room for improvement um, because you know what we're talking about is real. We don't have to go to Iraq to see this stuff. Abu Ghraib. All you have to do is go right to Virginia, go to Maryland, go to New York State. This stuff is happening every day. The problem is the public, you know, they, they're not exposed to this because inside of these prisons, everything is concentrated. They keep the journalists out. No cameras allowed in this prison. They restrict your mail. They cut off your access to the telephone. They don't want you to get newspapers. Nothing. It's totally isolated. Um, I mean, I, I can't even come up with a number of how many guys I saw retreat into insanity under these conditions. Uh, and at these two facilities I'm talking about, they have no mental health treatment, you know? So you have all of this on you. You're locked in the cell, you, you can't see out the window, you can't visit your family, you're constantly being abused. And, you know, you know what about the idea, like, you can't see out this door and this police officer who hates you. He's assaulted you on various occasions. He's bringing you your meal. No, I mean, that's torture within itself. <laughs> you know, just, just imagine what this guy has did to your meal, especially when you found a sharp object in your meal before, or you saw mucus in your meal. No, I mean, it's, it's happening. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 I just hope everyone here, um, you know, really, uh, you know, does what they can to raise awareness around this issue. Um, because it's real, I mean, people are being killed and it's, none of us in this room, I don't believe, are police officers, are correctional officers, but, you know, we all have families and some of our family members could be in these places that we're talking about. So, thank you all for listening to me. And um, I can't wait to hear the other witnesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll go right to uh, Ms. Sophia Tan. Good afternoon. I want to um, thank Representative Davis for your leadership on this issue, and also say thanks to John both for sharing your story and for becoming such an amazing advocate after everything that he's been through. 
Um, my name is Cynthia Totten, and I work as an advocate at um, Just Detention International, which is an international human rights organization uh, that works to end sexual abuse in all forms of detention. We do work around the world, including in South Africa and other countries, but um, the focus of our work is primarily on the United States, where sexual abuse in detention facilities continues to be a pervasive problem. It's been estimated by the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is part of the Department of Justice, that 216,000 men, women, and children are sexually abused in prisons, jails, and uh, youth detention facilities every year. Um, this includes abuse by both staff and other inmates. Um, and these numbers don't include abuse in police cells, immigration detention facilities, or co uh, community corrections, among other types of, of detention settings. The sexually abusive conduct taking place in these settings includes everything from groping inmates for sexual gratification during search processes um, to sexual assault and rape. Many of the victims of this type of abuse endure these violations not just once, but many times, sometimes for months or years on end. A great deal of our work at Just Detention International has focused on the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which was the first federal civil law in the U.S. Uh, to address um, sexual abuse in detention. One of the hallmarks of that law is that it requires the development of national mandatory standards, um, standards that will be used to address, um, prevent, and respond to sexual abuse. And it uh, contains requirements like classification assessments to address the type of issue that John mentioned, that you don't just throw someone who's known to be a sexual predator in with someone who is nonviolent or does not have that type of um, hasn't shown that type of behavior and would there, therefore be, be very vulnerable to sexual abuse. Um, okay. Um, and I'm gonna, I wanna share a story uh, from a survivor of sex, sexual abuse in a prison in, um, in, in Texas, but I just want to say a little bit more. So the, the standards that I mentioned will have to be implemented in prisons, jails, juvenile facilities, police lockups around the United States. Um, but PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, doesn't um, include civil or criminal remedies for sexual abuse and detention. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to be here to t today to support this law because it actually does involve putting those criminal penalties in place for torture. In our work at JDI, we emphasize uh, that sexual abuse is in fact a form of torture and cruel and human or degrading treatment. Um, and a great deal of our work focuses on um, increasing government accountability for these types of acts. For example, we're currently involved in efforts to call upon the United States to ratify the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. And this is a protocol under the UN Convention Against Torture that would establish a system of periodic visits by independent domestic and international bodies composed of persons knowledgeable about prison conditions and applicable human rights obligations. Um, those persons would visit detention facilities around the country and propose confidentially, um, confidentially propose recommendations uh, to officials that would then be used to prevent torture. Um, we're also involved in efforts with other U.S. organizations to raise concerns about the treatment of detainees um, and other human rights issues before the UN on an ongoing basis. So for example, later this year, it's expected that the US is gonna come before the UN Human Rights Council to assess its compliance with its obligations under the international um, covenant on civil and political rights. And like the Convention Against Torture, that international covenant also has uh, a prohibition against torture and cruel and human or degrading treatment. Um, organizations like ours will submit shadow reports to the Council that will basically document shortcomings and uh, steps forward in the U.S.'s, um, US's you know, conduct. In, in the 
And the council, the, the Human Rights Council, like the Committee Against Torture, has in fact expressed grave concern about sexual abuse in U.S. Uh, prisons, jails, and immigration detention facilities, um, juvenile facilities, etc. Uh, for example, the Human Rights Council has expressed concern regarding the sexual abuse of women inmates by male guards who, in many cases, continue to have access to women in housing areas and, and other areas where there's an increased risk of sexual abuse. Um, so I just want to go ahead and share the story now of uh, Garrett Cunningham, who is a survivor of sexual abuse. He was a prisoner at a state prison in Texas, and he uh, very bravely um, has become a survivor, an advocate um, on the issue of, of sexual abuse and detention, and testified before the National Prison Rape Elimination Commission. And this was a commission that was established in connection with the Prison Rape Elimination Act that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So I'm just going to um, read his story. My name is Garrett Cunningham, and as a former prisoner of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, I have firsthand experience with the violence and abuse that takes place within America's prisons. I was housed at the Luther Unit in Navasota, Texas. I worked in the prison's laundry under the supervision of corrections officer Michael Cheney. After just a few weeks of working with Officer Cheney, he began to touch me in a sexual manner during pat searches. At first, I thought it was accidental, but since it continued every day, I soon realized his inappropriate at touching was intentional. He also stared at me when I showered and made sexual comments. I was afraid to tell anyone about my problems with Officer Cheney, but I finally went to the unit psychologist and told him about the touching and crude comments. He advised me to stay away from Officer Cheney. The prison psychologist's advice did nothing to prevent the sexual harassment, so a month later I decided to go to the prison's administration for help. I approached the assistant warden and his second-in-command officer and told them about Cheney's sexual comments and sexual touching during pat searches. They told me that I was exaggerating and that Cheney was just doing his job. I eventually confronted Cheney and told him to stop touching me. He, got, he only got angry and continued to harass me. I tried again to get help from prison administrators, but I was told to keep my mouth shut. Officer Cheney eventually raped me. On that day, I had just finished my job at the prison's laundry and began walking to the back of the room to take a shower. Suddenly, Cheney shoved me, knocking me off balance. I screamed and get to, uh, to struggled to get him off me, but he was too big. Officer Cheney weighed around 300 pounds. I'm 5 feet 6 inches tall and weigh 145 pounds. While I struggled, Cheney handcuffed me. He then pulled down my boxers and forcefully penetrated me. When I screamed from the terrible pain, Cheney told me to shut up. I tried to get away, but I could barely move under his weight. After it was over, I was dazed. He took me to the showers in handcuffs, turned on the water, and put me under it. I was crying under the shower, and I saw blood running down my legs. He left and came back with a liquid that stung when he poured it on my behind. When he took the handcuffs off me, he threatened me. He said that if I ever reported him, he would have other officers write false assault cases against me, and I would be forced to serve my entire sentence or be shipped to a rougher unit where I would be raped all the time by prison gang members. He also warned me not to say anything to the officials I had complained to before because they were his friends and they would always help him out. At first, I didn't dare tell anyone about the rape, but eventually I was so afraid of being raped again that I told the unit psychologist that Cheney had raped me. He moved me to another job with a different supervisor and told me that if anyone asked why my job was changed, I should say that I wanted a change of scenery. A few days later, I was given a new position in the laundry next door to where Cheney worked. I continued to see him regularly, and he continued to touch me inappropriately. I wrote the Internal Affairs Department two times about Cheney's inappropriate touching. They never addressed my concerns and failed to take precautions to protect me. I was too scared to file a written complaint against Cheney because I feared retaliation from prison officials. Instead, I requested a private meeting with an internal affairs investigator. I received no response to my request, and Cheney was never punished for assaulting me. Officer Cheney went on to sexually harass and assault other prisoners. One year later, Nathan Essery began working under Cheney's supervision in the same laundry where I had previously been assigned. On several occasions, Nathan was forced to perform sex acts on Cheney. Fortunately for Nathan, he was able to collect Cheney's semen during two of the attacks, and DNA testing positively linked the samples to Cheney. Cheney finally resigned from the Luther unit when he was indicted for his crimes against Nathan Essery. Eventually, he pled guilty to sexual contact with an incarcerated person, but he will serve no time in prison. 
So that's just one story that I think really underscores the, the need for this uh, bill that, that we're talking about today. Um, I'm going to close there, um, but, but I think that what we see in so many of the cases at JDI where we hear from many survivors of sexual abuse every week is the lack of accountability um, on the part of the government, on the part of officials who are either directly involved or complicit or fail to protect inmates from this type of abuse. And uh, the need for, for someone to listen to these stories and to act on it is, is really great. Um, so hopefully we're moving towards being able to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll go to... So my name is Emily Tucker. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Detention Watch Network. We are a 200-member coalition of organizations and individuals that are working to end the practice of immigration detention in the United States. I really want to thank Congressman Davis um, for introducing this important piece of legislation and for inviting me here today to talk about its potential impact on a population that's uniquely vulnerable to abuses of state power, um, immigration, Im immigrants who are subject to detention and deportation. In 2007, a man named Bubakar Ba, a 52-year-old 50, tailor from Guinea, fell and suffered a head injury in the bathroom at Elizabeth Detention Center, an immigration detention facility in New Jersey, operated by Corrections Corporation of America, a private prison company, under contract with the federal government. Mr. Ba began vomiting and screaming in pain and manifesting other symptoms which medical experts subsequently described as textbook signs of intracranial bleeding. Instead of providing care, the medical staff at the detention center wrote Mr. Ba up for bad behavior, put him in restraints, and threw him in solitary confinement, where he lay for 15 hours, intermittently foaming at the mouth, before someone finally called an ambulance. Emergency brain surgery was too late to save his life. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement incarcerates about 370,000 people a year. Although the government asserts that the purpose of immigration detention is not to punish, but simply to keep track of people they are trying to deport, and all the, although the courts have said that the purpose of immigration detention cannot constitutionally be to punish, ICE still locks immigrants up in the very same prisons and jails that are used to hold individuals who are serving time as punishment for criminal convictions. And as the other speakers today have shown in excruciating detail, the conditions of confinement in U.S. prisons and jails are horrific, not merely punitive, but abusive. No human being should have to endure the treatment we've heard about at this briefing, and everything you heard about today also happens to detained immigrants. But for those in immigration detention, there are additional dangers and complications. First of all, because immigration detention is technically civil detention, none of the constitutional protections, none of the constitutional protections protections mandated for those deprived of their liberty through criminal proceedings apply. People in deportation proceedings are not entitled to a lawyer, and 86% of those in detention do not have one. Because of draconian mandatory detention laws, the majority never even have a bond hearing to determine if imprisonment is necessary or appropriate. This means not only that many people end up in immigration detention who should no way be there at all, but also that detained immigrants are less likely to know that they have rights in prison or to feel empowered to assert them if they do know. Detained immigrants are also at a disadvantage because many of them don't speak English and because they are often transferred to facilities hundreds of miles from their communities without any notification to family members where they have no contact with the outside world. But perhaps the most glaring problem is that there are no enforceable standards that apply in immigration detention. ICE promulgates its own internal guidelines and monitors compliance itself, or so it says. There's no independent inspection or oversight, and therefore almost no transparency or accountability. In 2009, the Obama administration promised to draw up new standards for detention facilities that would still not have the force of actual regulations, but would at least be in keeping with the supposedly civil purpose of immigration detention. As of today, that effort has completely stalled, and Director Morton appears to have abandoned any plans to draw up civil detention standards. Most recently, the Department of Homeland Security has repudiated the Pri Prison Rape Elimination Act, which Cynthia talked to you about in, at length, which would have been the first enforceable standard to, to apply in the immigration context. 
um, the DHS insisted that it's unnecessary uh, that PREA apply in immigration detention, given that their own internal standard standards already exceed the requirements of PREA, which is a bit like saying you should not be bound by a state burglary statute because your religion prohibits stealing. The idea that ICE can be trusted to monitor its own conduct without the deterrent effect of possible liability is patently absurd. Bubakar Ba's case was the subject of a front page story in the New York Times, but that level of scrutiny is incredibly rare for abuses in immigration detention. Although she was eventually released and united with her son, she did not report the abuse because she, she fears retaliation and she fears jeopard jeopardizing her status, her immigration status here in the US. Unfortunately, Marie's story is not uncommon. All the factors that I've described together today raise the likelihood that an immigrant in detention will be subject to abuse, raise the likelihood that the abuse will have extreme negative consequences for the victim, and reduce the likelihood that the victim of that abuse will be able to seek a remedy. The few who do face the same legal hurdles, both substantive and procedural, that have been described by the panelists in today's briefing. And constitutional protections for incarcerated people are being further eroded every day. Just last Tuesday, the Supreme Court limited the ability of prisoners to bring Bivens suit, suits, which are a particular kind of uh, legal way of holding uh, federal actors accountable for abuse um, against the employees of private prison corporations, even when those employees are acting as stand-ins for the federal government. This limitation on liability is bad enough in the context of the criminal justice system where about seven to eight percent of prison beds are owned or managed by private contractors, but it's even more grave in the immigration detention context where nearly 50 percent of all beds are private. The legislation being introduced today would certainly not prevent or cure all of the defects with the immigration detention system that I've described, but it would at least add one new mechanism by which victims can seek redress for the mistreatment described here today mistreatment of a type that in many cases they came to the United States in the first place to escape. I just want to close by saying that um, I'm really happy to see uh, that Daryl and John were here today. Um, I'm a white lawyer, overeducated, um, you know, I've had a life of comparative uh, comfort and privilege and I really know nothing. I work on this stuff all day and I really know nothing about torture. I really know nothing about being locked up. And most of the people that I work with who are in the meetings where the policy asks, asks are getting made and legislation like this is getting drafted, most of those people are just like me. Um, and I really think that we only have a hope of creating systemic change if we who are currently in positions of privilege really work to have the voices of those who are impacted by all of these travesties represented um, and lifted up in, in briefings like this.